Um, so I'm going to be sort of chairing the conversation with Dr. Natasha Shivji today about um, sort of imperialism then and a little bit of imperialism now. <laughs> I'm <laughs> gonna imperialism every day, that's great. Um, I'm gonna read her bio just to give people a sense of who she is and um, sort of how she engages in sort of Walter Rodney's work. And then I'm gonna ask, it's a, it's a special request, those who were part of the prep session this afternoon, um, maybe one or two, just to pose a question, um, like from the prep session and, and what, 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 what you sort of found. And the reason why we wanna do that is because we are all at different spots and places in our journey with Walter Rodney. And I think uh, Dr. Natasha wants to frame her sort of conversation about imperialism and Rodney around your questions rather than jumping in. I know some people met Walter for the first time today, so that is the <laughs> other reason why we want to start from that point. So I'm gonna say, Dr. Natasha Issa Shivji is the director of the Institute for Research in Intellectual Histories of Africa in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge. She has previously taught in the history departments at the University of Dar es Salaam and the University of Dodoma on courses focusing on African political economy, the agrarian question in Africa, and Indian Ocean world history on East African littoral. Walter Rodney's work remained a central influence for her in both her teaching and in her own research as work that withstood the test of time and remained formidable in shaping the discourse of how we write our history, understanding the material realities of underdevelopment and imperialism, and yet within a framework that is emancipatory and audacious. Um, so there are some sort of places that she works and questions she works on. Um, and so when you do, if you do ask a question, I would like you to introduce yourself and the organization you come from and the place that you come from in Cape Town. Right. Okay, I'm opening it up. Otherwise, I'm gonna just ask Comrade Busi to start. Just joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, are we? So someone from the workshop this afternoon just to bring up a question that, they, that they're sitting with right now that they might have after spending time thinking about Walter today. Something they're still confused about around Walter. Or, or to sh yeah, <laughs> share what they learned. Uh, hello again. Uh, my name is Simpo Chikichela. I'm from Kwando Menalin Media. I'm based in Kailicha. <coughs> I had a brief conversation with my elder in front of me earlier, and he posed uh, a really uh, good question where he asked who were the perpetrators, who actually were the people involved uh, in <coughs> Walter Rutney's death, who were the perpetrators? Watch where I stand. Um, and got it. Good evening. My name is Carden Hendricks, and I also um, had a question from the person I had a discussion with this afternoon in my group. And her question, uh, too, was uh, who assassinated or who killed Walter? But then there was also the question. And I think this comrade already covered me with that question, but the question is why was Walter killed? Okay, one more. Comrade Loazi, I'm gonna ask you. Gonna <laughs> uh, no, okay. One, two. Yeah, no, my question is more similar to some of the questions which just came up now. Um, I want to know about the collaborators, you know, behind the death of uh, Walter. Uh, 
um, you know, whether internally in Africa, you know, where they, whether externally. Uh, so I just want to get like a, a, a perspective around the death of Walter. Who exactly sanctioned, you know, the death of Walter? But also I want to get, you know, a clarity about Walter, you know, as an intellectual that who was Walter for, you know, was he for a working class? So if ever I can get that kind of answer, you know, yeah, thanks. Okay, I'll give one more to Comrade Fadil and then Good evening. My name is Fadil Cupido. Uh, I'm from Menenberg on the Cape Flats. Um, just following on this comrade, uh, as we had a discussion, he, and last night on the screening, the wife, that is the wife of Walter, said that um, the individual and um, the government has not been brought to book after all these years. Now, um, in South Africa, we've got, um, you should know, Ahmad Timul, We've got uh, Imam Harun, you know, all um, strugglers that were killed and, you know, I don't know, but I know with Ahmad Timur there's been some uh, progress regarding, you know, um, justice. Um, so she said that we didn't get any justice, you know, they didn't get any justice for him. So I'd like to know why, why wasn't the fight or you know, the forces or to fight for his justice. Why did they, do, until now, why was there nothing? And why, why did the government, after all these years, get away? Um, you know, or little, yeah, thanks, that's about it. Okay, so there's a lingering question about uh, the circumstances under which uh, Walter Rodney passes on. And then there's a question about who Walter was for, which is a question about access and, and, and those kinds of um, framings. I've got questions about imperialism, um, which is a topic which we, we're moving toward. Tomorrow we will spend a lot of time thinking about the claims in the book. Um, and we really want to understand sort of maybe the key differences between imperialism then in Walter's sort of era and now today. Um, I know you said it jokingly earlier, but you're saying imperialism then, imperialism now, imperialism all the time. And so I'm wondering about what exactly you see as the character of imperialism today. Um, since we're living in such a much freer time, as we like to say, um, you know, in a difference, but we know we, we, we don't. And yeah, so. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's truly inspiring to be in a space like this. Um, coming from Tanzania, often we try to build spaces like this, but we're not always successful. Perhaps we don't have the longevity of struggle that you all have here, um, or, it's, or the immersion in violence. Um, for us, things are more subtle. They're there, they're the same, but they're more subtle. They're not so much in our face. So we take it easy sometimes. Um, so thank you, thank you for inviting me here. I'm sure I'll have a lot more to learn from all of you than you can possibly learn from me. Um, in terms of answering your questions about who Walter Rodney was and how he died, I'm possibly as much in the dark as you are since I too didn't live in his time. But from what I've read, I think the struggles around his assassination um, have been ongoing for a long time because very unjustly they had actually framed his brother, Donald Rodney, for a long time. And so I think the initial struggle from the family, friends, and comrades of Walter Rodney was to try and clear Donald Rodney's name of this great injustice that they had imposed on him. Um, and I think they managed to do that. Finally, there was some recognition from the government that Donald Rodney did not obviously partake in the murder of his own brother and was actually very much part of the struggle. 
And I think it is, of course, abundantly clear that it was the government that was the perpetrator to what extent and who the collaborators were. It's a struggle that still continues and one that has to be exposed. Um, but who, who Walter Rodney was and what he stood for in the 38 years of his life is of far more interest to us and far more relevance because I think he left lessons that were enduring and relevant to today. When you read today how Europe underdeveloped Africa or you read Walter Rodney's writings and articles and there's an article in Cheche on the African uh, laboring class Cheche was a magazine that was produced in the 1970s and um, at the University of Dar es Salaam. And even when you read these articles today, you f you're left inspired, you're left thinking about your current conditions. It's as if he had written today. And that's a place I want to start from. Scholars who write in a way that is not meant for a bourgeois intellectual, that is not meant for their fellow scholars in ivory towers, but is really meant for the masses, for the people. It is meant for pe those who are reading it with a purpose of actually engaging in a struggle. How do they do that? What are they writing about? Who are they writing for? And I think that can answer many of our questions in terms of the characteristic of imperialism, what Walter Rodney stood for, and who he stood against. So I will, um, I will begin with some themes that I thought were, that perhaps can build a foundation into entering the discussion of imperialism. Um, I will try and make this less of a lecture and more of an engagement. So please, please feel free to stop me and to engage with me and ask me questions and comment um, at any point. So the first thing I wanted to talk about <clears throat> was the question of uneven development um, in Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Because I think that the question of uneven development, and forgive me if it sounds very arbitrary to begin with, but it'll make sense, okay? The question of uneven development brings us into two categories of how Walter Rodney perceived the question of uneven development, why that is critical in how he understood the emancipatory potential of any movement that would come out of, these, of the context of imperialism, of the context of the contradictions of imperialism. Now the way I have understood what he's writing is on the first instance, so, We're going to talk about uneven development in two phases and how this brings us to the present moment. Let's first engage with the idea of pre-capitalism. In African societies, in the global south in general, but trying to keep it more to our societies, we often have many misconceptions on how the pre-capitalist world existed, right? Often we're thought to discuss the pre-capitalist world as if it existed as a conglomerate of tribes, so-called tribes at best, and at worst as a people with absolutely no history. And these are usually the two versions that are given to us in the mainstream about the history that existed prior to colonialism. Walter Rodney was a historian. His PhD thesis was actually on pre-capitalist societies in the Upper Guinea Coast. And in it, he makes a very important contribution which he carries on into how Europe underdeveloped Africa which is the condition, the context of these pre-capitalist societies was neither uniform, it was neither static and unchanging, but rather it was, very, it was, varied, in its, um, it was varied in its formation, it was constantly evolving, and it represented many complexities of society. This was not an uncomplex society, it was not a simple society, it was not one that was not changing and evolving, Neither was it one that was purely categorized in one form that Western scholars like to say, which is tribes, right? 
He explains in it that pre-capitalist societies existed in various political formations. Now it's very important that we remember this as we move forward, that our societies had political formations. If those political formations did not take the shape of state and governance that we see today, it does not mean that they were not political formations. There were forms of leadership, there were forms of authority, there were forms of control, there were forms of coercion. This is not to romanticize these societies, right? These were not idyllic societies, they were not romantic societies where everyone lived in this egalitarian, equal fashion, because I think that is a historical injustice in itself. There were societies that were complex, that were ridden with all kinds of contradictions, that were ridden with inequalities, as they were ridden with kind of potentials for a better future, right? But the point is that these were complex societies. They had political formations in place. These political formations both exerted forms of authority as in all its ways, whether it was through ideology, that is religion, that is spirituality, that is whatever context that they were able to get support for their authority, or through coercion in many cases, the expansion of empires, etc. Let me give you a few examples. Walter Rodney gives various examples from Nigeria, from West Africa. He gives examples from Southern Africa. I will give you some examples from Eastern Africa, which is what I'm most familiar with. In Eastern Africa, for example, we have the Kilwa city-state. We had the Kilwa city-state, right? A very well-known city-state which existed, which was at its height in the 14th century and began to fall in the 15th century, right? Now, this city-state had what we can call this political formation I'm talking about, right? It was not a state in the way we imagine a state today. However, it had a sultanate, it had wazirs, which are what we would call ministers, a very loose translation. It used Islam as an ideological apparatus in order to exert its control, right? There were forms of coercion, but it was very different from the way we would imagine a state today. However, it had this political authority. There were forms of authority in place in the city-state. Kilwa is a city-state. I should have mentioned it's, it was located in southern Tanzania. It still exists today as a, as a, as a space in Tanzania. Um, in southern Tanzania, it, ex, it engaged in long-distance trade across the Indian Ocean. And this was the kind of center of its economy, right? So these were, it was a very complex society that had political authority, that engaged in exchange across the Indian Ocean trade, used Islam as an ideology to both facilitate trade, to create a common language across the Indian Ocean, but also to create a hegemonic, hegemonic apparatus within Kilwa. Today we speak of hegemonic apparatus in the, as located within the state, right? The state basically uses the media, it uses um, our televisions, it uses our entertainment spaces, it uses sometimes even our so-called activist spaces, in order to exert its idea of what society should look like. And we resist that in return. Sometimes we internalize it without even knowing. The hegemon hegemonic ex um, apparatus, in the case, for example, of the Kilwa city-state, did not necessarily reside in the state, right? The state was a ruler, but it resided in different apparatus. For example, it res resided in the imams in an Islamic state. Right, it resided in religious scholars who were called the ulama, who were scholars of religion, particularly Islam. It resided in those spaces where they were able to somehow exert ideas of society through religion in order to create a space that adhered to political authority, but did not necessarily know what it was. Sometimes it was even unseen. This is just one example of what a political formation might have looked like in pre-capitalist society, right? A city-state like this was heavily influenced by trade and exchange. Another example, the Ajuran city-state. A few are even of the impression that this might have been a mythical city-state, but there's plenty of evidence that it existed. It existed in Somalia. It was a pastoral city-state, very much unlike Kilwa. It had a similar political formation, but it relied heavily on pastoralism in the hinterland.
It did not necessarily engage with trade directly across the Indian Ocean, although it had connections to places like Mogadishu and the Swahili coast, right? And the, the, the way it was structured around pastoralists, that is farmers and agriculturalists, the tribute it, ex it, exerted, it uh, extracted sorry, from the peasants and the agriculturalists, from the pastoralists who are livestock keepers, was what kept the Ajaran city-state alive. In formation, it was quite different from the Kilwa city-state. This existed on the coast, this existed on the hinterland. They relied heavily on each other in many ways, but they were formed in separate ways, right? So this is just to give you examples of the complexity and of the nature of city-states during this time. What Walter Rodney argues at great length in how Europe underdeveloped Africa is that because of the variation in these city-states, because of how complex they were, because of their locale, because of where they were positioned, literally where they were positioned on the African continent, this was a complex continent. This was a continent that was very, very different in its formations, in its position, its environment, et cetera. So when there is external influence in the form of imperialist forces, there's always been external influence on the continent, right? We can't say that the Europeans were the first to enter the continent, of course they were not. Just as I mentioned, Kilwa was engaging in the city-state, the entire Swahili coast on the East African coast, I'm sure you can give examples from South Africa. Many of you could probably find resonance in what I'm saying. Um, facilitated not only exchange of goods, but exchange of people. People would settle on the coast, they would intermarry, they would create families. So exter I, this idea of external influence has always been there. The question is the nature of that influence, right? The nature of the influence and how it came to be. Now, in the, in the period um, after the 1500s, when you start having the initial waves of European explorers coming in, and then, particularly in 1885, when the Berlin Conference is starting to be finalized and you have these Europeans really charting out their way on the continent, colonialism coming in full force, there is another assumption that Walter Rodney tries to refute and that is very critical in our discussion today, I believe, which is that when they come, first, it is not a complete destruction of an entire continent, its peoples, and its ideas, okay? It's not a complete destruction. Two, having said that, a very important caveat is that while it is not a complete destruction of an entire continent and its peoples, what remains is transformed within a different mode of production, within a different set of ideas, okay? So what remains is transformed. Now let's go through these two phases. The idea of it not being a complete destruction follows from what we just described. That how can you possibly destroy an entire continent in one sweep when there's such a great variation of political formations? When there's such a great variation in how people live, how they engage with their environment, and environment both the climate but also their physical environment, how they engage in the economies that they've created, Right? So for example, with the Kilwa city-state, it was on the coast, right? It's based right on the coast of Tanzania. It was engaged in long distance trade across the Indian Ocean. When the Portuguese came in the, 15, in the 1500s, they do essentially destroy the civilization because they're able to access the coast through, their, through the ship that come in. They're able to access the coast very immediately. It's an environment that they're able to engage with. And that trade is one that they're already getting familiar with, given that they're working on sea. The Ajuran city-state, however, is not destroyed so easily. In fact, it is outside the purview of the initial colonizers. They're not quite aware of it. An even more apt example that might help us understand why it was not a complete destruction is an example of the Witu Sultanate. The Witu Sultanate is one that is even less known Right? The only reason I'm uh, giving this as an example is because it's something I've been recently working on. But it, and there are many examples like this. It existed in the hinterland. It was formed in the 18th century. By the 19th century, it is at its peak. And we're talking about a period between the 1880s to the 1910s when, when the, the Germans are already in East Africa, in Tanzania, and the British are already 
um, entering after, shortly after the Germans. But they have no idea about the Witu Sultanate. They hear there is formidable Sultanate in the hinterland where the ex-slaves of Zanzibar and Kilwa, there was slavery during the Indian Ocean period and later that was propagated by the European imperialists, are running to. So there's a political formation happening here that is very much focused on the kind of political, that is very much taking its, taking its lead from the formations that were formed on the coast, but starting completely afresh. And the people who are coming to this are people who have been basically removed, basically destroyed from the coast, and they are running into the Witu Sultanate. The colonizers are completely unaware of the Witu Sultanate. And even when they become aware of it, they're unable to access it. Because this is in the hinterland, they fear the hinterland, they have no access to the hinterland, right? So it is maintained long after the initial period of colonialism. Eventually, it does decline as they get more access to this hinterland, right? So when they tell us that by the 15th century, with the coming of Vasco da Gama, et cetera, everything is destroyed, there really were persistent formations that continue to exist. Now, we can't romanticize this idea, though, because then we run a different danger of not understanding, not understanding our societies, right? Because if we romanticize it as if these organizations ran parallel to imperialist forces and how they destroyed parts of the continent, then we enter a different phase where we're arguing that, well, colonialism and imperialism in general were just a particular moment, a particular aspect of African history. But much of African history has been preserved, so we really don't have much of a problem, right? It kind of is almost apologetic for what colonialism did to the continent. And we don't want to go down that route because it is ahistorical. Colonialism certainly did destroy the continent in various ways. The persistence of things, of situations like this were not because there was a, somehow a parallel development to imperialist forces, but rather out of necessity, they persisted and changed their formations. They changed their discourses. And not long after, they came to be subsumed into colonialism. So to this day, we might see fragments that look like our past, right? We might be able to see how people dress, the cloth they wear, the beads on their neck. We might be able to see the language they use, the Islamic references in the case of my region, of the Indian Ocean Network, etc. Fragments, little bits and pieces of what this history might have looked like, right? And sometimes we use that and we mistakenly say that, look, our history is well and alive. If it is well and alive, two things can come, two conclusions can come out of it. Either colonialism was not a problem, imperialism doesn't exist, we have our history, what's the problem here? All we have to do is maintain it. Two, let's go back to this idyllic kind of history. Let's retrace our steps and start wearing our clothes, and our identity resides in these little fragments, right? So the whole kind of identity representational discourse that we have today, where we are represented by the clothes we wear, the beads, we, the songs we sing, et cetera, without being critical about it, without being critical of what do those beads and clothes and songs represent today? Whose songs are they, right? You might find a multimillionaire in the seat of power, wearing the same, um, we call kanga and kitenge, the, clo the, the clothes we use, wearing the same one as a woman tilling her farm, right? Does that represent our identity and our history as a people? Are we, can, are we not in a position to understand the contradictions that these two people are wearing the same cloth belong to very different classes? How did these classes come about, right? So we don't want to take these fragments and have them represent either a coherent history that we can return to or have them represent a future that, is, that can apologize for the place imperialism and particularly colonialism and neocolonialism have played on our continent. According to Walter Rodney, despite the unevenness of destruction, despite the unevenness of subsumption, right? And by subsumption, I mean the very simply, and perhaps very inaccurately, the integration of the African 
economy, social life into capitalism. That unevenness did not mean the society was not transformed, but it was transformed in a, in a way that was not uniform. And this is going to play an important part when we think of what Walter Rodney saw as a revolutionary potential and the emancipatory potential within capitalism, okay? So that is a very important aspect, I think, of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, the focus on these pre-capitalist societies, not to return to them, not to idealize them, not to romanticize them, but also not to claim that they were completely destroyed, but to try and understand what exactly happened in a very uneven and complex way. Before I go on, I'd like to stop and see if there are any clarifications or questions that you may have at this stage. Maybe even thinking through examples of your own. Good afternoon, my name is Salente Kumbi. I am a student at the University of Cape Town and I'm also in the UCT SRC. Originally, I'm from Durban, KZN, from a township of Mlazi. And I, the, the example that came to mind, or rather a question that I'd also like to pose, is the effect of these uh, political structures that existed uh, in trying to oppose uh, the collusion that was happening. The example I can use is from my home province is Shagazul, right? Shagazulu created um, the Zulu nation, which didn't exist at the time. It was Nguni tribes. And when he saw the effects of colonialism from, from Cape Town, the Western Cape, he decided to group them all into uh, a Zulu nation in order to create an army to physically fight um, the British and the Bruce that were invading his in. Now, in, in a case where these didn't exist, because I, I heard you talk about not romanticizing uh, these um, that existed. In a case where these didn't exist, so, such as Ushagazulu, look at our history, the effects of colonialism could have been even more dire, right? Um, the things that I know that are preserved or that I, I st I'm still able to find do not even exist. And that's why I find it hard not to romanticize such. So I would like to pose a question about, do you think that these were necessary and why is it bad to romanticize them? Thank you. Um, I think they were absolutely necessary. Not, uh, not in fact, necessary undermines. They were inevitable, right? These movements were inevitable. They had to happen. Wherever there is oppression, there is resistance. When I say not to romanticize our societies, what I mean is not that we shouldn't celebrate the incredible resistance and resilience that our societies have sh shown throughout our history and continue to show. What I mean to say is that we shouldn't fall into the same trap as the Orientalists, right? Now, these Orientalists are ones that kind of, through cultural discourse, that seems very um, unaggressive, right? That these societies were beautiful, they were simple in their nature, everybody interacted in a very simple way. Um, there's a particular characteristic to people of a particular skin color. There's a particular character which is very giving, which is very simple, things like this. That is what I mean, that when we romanticize our societies, when we make them into a single idea, right, we run the risk of playing the same game as the Orientalists. We run the risk of almost caricaturing our societies. And I think something that Walter Rodney persistently reminds us through his work is that our societies were complex, and that is the greatest respect we can give to our societies. These are complex societies. They're societies where variation of emotion exists, if we want to talk about in the Orientalist language, where a variation of behavior exists, where a variation of political thought exists, a variation of people exists, right? These are complex societies, and they always have been. 
we always think of European Western societies as very complicated, full of thinkers who are debating each other. Do we think of them as one, right? Do we, do we think of them as societies where there is no debate, where they've moved in one direction, where they've existed in the same way over century after century? No, we're constantly looking at European debates. We're constantly looking at the kind of polemics that they engaged in, you know, the kind of arguments and wars and fights and whatever they engaged in, whether it was intellectual or physical. But we don't do the same for our societies, right? So when I say we shouldn't romanticize our societies, what I'm saying is we should instead focus on the complexity of our societies through various ways. For example, intellectual debate, right? We did not only exist to resist colonialism. That's teleological. We existed to think. We existed to make sense of our environment. We were curious about our environment. We were thinking about our environment. We were telling stories about it, we were debating it, we disagreed on it, right? I mean, they're excavating at, I think many scholars in, at UCT actually have done some great work in excavating um, works from Timbuktu, right? We were, there were debates, there's evidence of writing from a very, very long period where there were debates so about showing the curiosity of, to, towards society, right? Even the resistance to colonialism, it didn't only come through physical, um, through physical resistance. People were arguing against colonialism through writing, through speaking, to sto through storytelling. They were formulating their own ideas about colonialism, right? They were arguing against it based on the very vast scientific, social, cultural knowledge they had of their own societies. And that is what I mean when we shouldn't romanticize our societies. We should absolutely celebrate the inevitable nature of resistance, but we should not simplify our societies. Um, so I'll, I'll yeah. So, so we hear about the concept of diversity, so does it have any link to uh, these different political formations, and is it a new concept? Because from my perspective, even my personal perspective, the word diversity is a concept which comes, you know, post, um, Apartheid. Yeah, I'll just respond. Um, yeah, I'm not talking about diversity. I can understand why you would think I'm... I'll ask that we suspend all... <laughs> all this kind of postmodern language that we have today, the idea of diversity and representation and identity. I know that it's inevitable that we will always try and connect, right? But I'm, I'm not talking about diversity necessarily, that people exist in different ways but can coexist at the same time. Because we don't really know what the ethos of that time was, how people viewed their environment, how they viewed each other. What I'm simply saying is that there were uneven developments, right? People were existing in an uneven way. And the difference in these environments is not one that we are judging at this point. So sometimes diversity is something that we aspire to in the kind of pseudo-political language that we have today. So if we impose that language on this particular period, we might run the risk of saying that, well, we aspire to that kind of coexistence. We don't know if people coexisted in harmony. There are various instances where we see empires expanding with very bloody warfare right in the 13th century, right? It's not about people coexisting in harmony and us aspiring to that, but it's us understanding that society was uneven, it existed in different ways, and what potential can that give us for today? So I'll take one more, and then we go back, yeah. Uh, so, so I might be an anticipating, um, um, maybe I'm, but I, I, it's a question that popped up from what you were talking about. I mean, when you're speaking about the, the kind of, you know, the conflicts and the contradictions, um, you know, some, some things we might see egalitarian, some things completely authoritarian, repressive in pre-capitalist society, and, you know, how there was a shift at some point um, where even though there were so, so like, um, you know, these different societies with different formations and different kinds of ways of organizing and formations that are taking place, but there's a kind of shift at some point. Um, you know, obviously on Africa there was like forms of slavery before the, the colonialists at some point in time. There was a form, forms of, of kind of repression that were taking place. What was it about European 
uh, slavery, colonialism, that whole thing that was a different kind of external imperialism that kind of was so cataclysmic compared to what it experienced before, because obviously the Arabs came down at some point in time, there's all these kind of things, but it was a different kind of nature, some people say, to what was taking place there, to what the Europeans eventually enacted upon the continent. That was kind of just like a kind of watershed, historic um, break from what, they did, what it was experienced before. What is it that's unique about the colonial moment or the kind of slavery space that, that was kind of different to the, the wars, the genocides, all these kind of things that had taken place on the continent potentially beforehand? Okay. Sorry, sorry. Thanks. So that brings us to our second aspect of uneven development, right? So here we've kind of set the space, right? That these are uneven societies. They exist in different ways. They're complex. Political formations exist. There are various forms of exploitation, coercion that coexist with various forms of egalitarianism and cooperation, just like our societies today, right? The specific nature that you're asking about colonialism, this particular form of imperialism that was different from what existed prior to it, whether it was the slave trade, like the Atlantic slave trade, whether it was um, the colonialism that comes in the 19th century, the specific nature of it was its universality. And again, when I say this, I really want you to suspend any kind of positive judgments that come with the idea of universality, right? So the idea of universality that particularly Rodney speaks of, the idea of the global nature of capitalism, is that capitalism necessarily, in its processes of destruction, in its processes of co-option and coercion, had to bring the entire world into the fold of capital. That was the only way that capital could function. Now, for example, the slave trade that existed across the Indian Ocean, right? Some scholars are even a little dubious about calling it the slave trade, although it was, of course, slavery, right? It was very much domestic-based, right? So people were going and working in households. There was proliferation of um, concubinage, etc. This was the kind of slavery that was happening. Conspicuous consumption is what it's been called, right? During the, 19, during the 17th, 8, during the 17th, 18th, 19th century, the kind of slave that is happening across the Indian Ocean is very much through plantations and cash crop production, particularly clove plantations in Zanzibar. It is exploitative in nature. It is not to say that these were lesser forms of coercion. It is to say the extent of it and the nature of production was very different than how the Europeans engage in the slave trade across the Atlantic and how they engage in colonialism throughout the continent. The complete subsumption of every single human being, the complete subsumption of every way of life into the fold of capital, I think was the greatest violence and the most specific nature of capitalism. And this is something that Lenin argues in when he's thinking about the periphery, right? The idea of the periphery in relation to the center. And that is what brings us to the question of this idea of transformation and combined and uneven development. Now, this idea of combined and uneven development is something that Walter Rodney uses a lot. But he's actually engaging a lot with Trotsky. Now, Trotsky in his history of the Russian Revolution, presented the idea of the Russian Revolution in a different way than the kind of Western scholars of the Russian Revolution. And you'll see in a minute why I'm going in a direction that's completely, right, out of our, but in a second it'll come to it. He represents it as, he goes against the idea of the stage model. Now, I don't know how much we know about this Marxist stage model. It's going to be very important, right? The idea that you know, societies go through these stages. They go through this communalist stage, and then they move into um, the, the, they move into the feudalist stage, then they move into the capitalist stage, and then into the socialist stage, and then into the communist stage, right? This stage model. It's, it was 
it's a simplified version even of Marx's thought itself, right? That these stages happen in these five progressive phases depending on how society transforms itself. And the communalist phase is not communism, it is simply the idea that we were trying to refute to begin with, right? That, that these societies were very egalitarian to begin with. These very egalitarian societies then move into the feudalist stage where you have the serfs and the feudalists, right? Who are ex exploiting the serfs on their land and then there's slavery alongside it. And then you move into this whole capitalist stage where you know now there's enclosures have happened, slavery is gone and you have a capitalist stage where people have me the means to technology and there's an exploitative class, but technology is advancing because this exploitative class is able to build on technology. And then that moves into socialist phase because the contradictions in society will allow for this technology to be used for, by the state for the people. And that's the socialist phase. And then eventually when the state has, controls the means of production, which is going to be the working class state, you will move into the communist phase where there will be no state. It's a very, very simplified stage and we don't really need to pay too much attention to it. But this stage model was critiqued in the history of the Russian Revolution by Trotsky in a very specific way in what he called combined and uneven development. This idea of combined development argues that capitalism functions in what I just said through globalized social relations, right? Capitalism cannot simply function at the center of capitalism. And this is a very important point for us to take note of when we think of the nature of imperialism. It cannot simply function in the center of capital. That is, it doesn't just simply function in Europe. It doesn't simply function in America. It doesn't simply function in the so-called developed world. It necessarily functions by destroying and depending on countries outside of it in this idea of the center periphery model, right? Without the so-called periphery, without the so-called lesser developed nations, the center of capitalism cannot function. It depends on the extraction of resources. It depends on the exploitation of labor. It depends on very, very cheap markets to dump its goods on. Without that, the level of exploitation and the level of technological advancements can simply not exist in the center of capital. So this idea of combined, right, and he's talking specifically about Russia and the lesser developed areas of Eastern Europe, but what Rodney used it to think through Africa, right? He used it to think through Africa. And he's moving away from the whole Andre Gundre Frank idea of you know, dependency theories. And he's really looking at it because of this second, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this idea of combined development, that the whole world has to be subsumed in capital, but not in an even way. Okay, the whole world is not, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, exactly. That's a better word actually. It is vacuum, but it's a very coarse force process. S sorry. So this idea of this idea of these global social relations that are exploitative in nature is incredibly important. That an entire world has to be vacuumed into capital in order to extract resources that are not available in the center of capital in order to exploit labor, whether it's through slavery, whether it's through servitude, whether it's through indentured labor, whether it's through the working class and the peasant, but to get very, very cheap or free labor, right? To be able to extract these resources at almost nothing. And then, once those resources and labor has been exploited, to throw it back and get a market for it, right? That, that is the nature of capital. So the combined nature is very important when we think of it, and the uneven development is the second phase to that. So if you have countries being subsumed and vacuumed in this way, right? If you have them entering into the fold of capital through these coercive means, through these violent means, through these incredibly exploitative means, then you necessarily have uneven development. So if the center of capital, 
the Western countries are able to develop in a particular fashion, right? That they are able to reach the heights of capitalist development through technological advancements and production. That they're able to create a welfare state whereby the working people are somehow protected by the state, have certain protections by the state, even as they're exploited, the working class. When they're able to reach a phase of the so-called disappearing peasantry, where the peasantry simply don't exist because they have no need for tilling of the farms. If they have farms, they have these, they have these industrial kind of farms, right? Where you're not, there's no peasant that's being exploited as such. If they're able to reach that phase, they will develop theories that reflect that, right? And Rodney was coming in from that direction. He's saying that these theories that they develop that reflect these conditions, A, the idea that capitalism will bring about incredible advances in technology, right? And for the, for the Western Marxists, this means that that's an easier entry into socialism because you can't free a laboring class if you don't have technology to take up the work of the laboring class, right? The laborers can't be freed unless there's technology that does their work. So this idea that the heights of technology can be reached with capitalism and make that entry into socialism more foreseeable is one theory he refuted, and I think now we're starting to see the answer why. Two, this idea that a welfare state can be created in order to reduce the exploitation of the workers, right? That also he refuted because that is not possible. The over-exploitation of the workers is only reduced in the center of capital because you maintain a further exploitation of workers in the periphery, right? The laboring class is only freed or ostensibly freed in the center of capital where the state has protective measures like things like unions, etc., because there's a further exploitation of the working class and the peasantry in the periphery of capital. And finally, this idea that um, the, this, the peasantry are disappearing, that is an argument that is common in the center of capital. There is no peasantry. And it has been very strangely brought into our spaces by very respectable scholars on agrarian questions, which might be relevant to many of you working here this idea of the dis disappearing peasantry. The peasantry no longer exists because farms are basically industrial complexes. Those who work on the farms are proletarian by all stretches of the imagination. The peasantry have moved into factories and industry. There's no need for a small peasant to be tilling the farm for tomatoes and, um, for tomatoes and onions to eat at the end of the day, right? And this argument, these theories, again, are transported to us. Now, Rodney very earlier on refuted these ideas, right, based on the idea of combined and uneven development. He said, how can you possibly, how can you possibly imagine that in the periphery of capital, where it depends on, like we say, the extraction of resources, the exploitation of labor, and the dumping of goods into a very open market, how can you imagine any of these things being the case? Labor is not, there is no protection for workers, they're exploited to their bone every single day. In fact, like some scholars have argued, laborers, work, the working class who work in the cities, are actually subsidizing capital. And this might be an argument that those of you who work on the agrarian question have heard repeatedly. They're subsidizing capital, right? You have the peasants who are moving into the urban areas, a story of colonialism, in the form of migrant labor, right? They're moving to the urban areas during the colonial period to work on the, on the railroads, to work in the shops, to work in the factories, to work in administration, to work in various places of the colonial structures. The peasants cannot survive off the land, and this has continued to this day, if we're gonna talk about the nature of imperialism enduring, it has continued to this day, where peasants simply cannot survive off the land, because either the land is expropriated by um, foreign investors, it is stolen by the state, it is simply burnt down. In an example I will give you shortly in my own work, it is destroyed and peasants can no longer survive on the land. They're not able to keep the skin on their back simply off their land unless they become workers on the land, the land that is stolen from them. So they move into the urban settings to take on menial jobs to stay alive, but their 
their, their families remain on the land. So may, it's in most cases the man who goes into the urban, that's changing now. They go into the urban center to try and make a small income and have the family survive in the rural areas, right? So this dynamic that has occurred and continues to exist very much so in this particular moment has been understood that the peasant no longer exists. We're simply looking at a working class in the urban areas. This is not the case for two reasons. One, the peasant very much exists, but the peasant is not able to survive off the land. But that does not mean that the peasant has been liberated off the land. They simply cannot survive off the land. That does not equate liberation from the land and the tasks of the land. It simply means that that relationship is more exploitative. And Rodney saw this at that point, and we see it today. So there's no question of a disappearing peasantry. It's an overexploitation of the peasantry, right? Secondly, this idea that um, when, when people move into the urban centers, they're now entering into capitalism, which means capitalism can advance in all its glory because you have a huge population becoming the working class and now you can really advance technology. Many of those who move into the urban areas, they're no, like in South Africa, we, I'm sure you have a slightly different, you have different conditions, but really in information it's not, it's a variation. In our country, my in my country, Tanzania, you don't have factories, you don't have an industry, you don't have people going and working and you know, forming unions and being called a working class. People go into the urban centers to sell things and hawk things on the street. They go into the urban centers, women go into the urban centers, prostitution. They go into the urban centers to you know, become bus drivers. But they live lives that are backbreaking. They live lives that are humanely impossible to sustain. But the, the greatest injustice of this kind of migration is that that so-called welfare state that the West has offered its working class, protections from uni union protections, you know, sort of kind of subsidies here and there, is not offered by the working people, is not offered to the working people in our countries. When the bus driver drives the bus from 5 a.m. in the morning to 4 a.m. in the evening and sleeps for one hour, and he's expected to start again at 5 a.m., who is subsidizing that? Who is protecting that bus driver? If the bus breaks, the bus driver is expected to fix that broken bus. If the bus falls asleep, if the bus driver falls asleep on the job and there's an accident, the bus driver is held accountable. Who owns the bus? I'm sure some wealthy um, entrepreneur has collected 10, 12 buses, but he is not responsible at all for those buses. The bus driver is entirely responsible. That's what subsidizing capital is meant. That's what I mean by subsidizing capital, right? So all the costs that should be taken by the owner, all the costs that should be taken by the state, the worker takes on his or herself. They take it on themselves. They take up those costs. And that is where the super exploitation of the labor exists. Tied to the land and subsidizing capital in the city. And that is the relationship we have. So the idea of a welfare state, the idea of technological advancements, the idea of um, swiftly moving to a different stage cannot exist in our countries. It does not exist in our countries. The laboring class is thoroughly exploited and it is it is oppressed to an extent where there is, no, and there is no advancement of technology. It is simply the super exploitation of the labor in order to subsidize the costs of capital. And it is in this way that the center of capital is able to flourish with its technological advancements and offer this kind of welfare warfare, welfare warfare state that it afforded its people and the world around, okay? So that's, 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 an important aspect to remember when we think of this idea of combined and uneven development, that this is the way in which it really functions in, in reality in our countries. And we'll move into the contradiction this raises in a second. But before I move on, I would like to give an example that might be more... There's a great book by Utsa Patnayak that I remember I used to use to teach when I was um, teaching at the University of Dodoma, 
um, in Tanzania. It's called The Republic of Hunger, right? And it's a collection of essays. And she's made this argument in several places, but in this she makes it very simple and accessible. And one argument that she refutes, I don't know how many of you know of Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. So Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, it's quite simple, really. What it assumes, you have country A and you have country B, right? If country A can produce cotton and chocolate, the first assumption is country B can also produce cotton and chocolate, right? Both countries can produce cotton and chocolate. But for country A, because of various reasons, maybe it is labor, maybe it is technology, whatever reason, they can produce cotton more easily than they can produce chocolate. Country B can produce chocolate more easily than they can produce cotton, right? So it is in the favor it is in the advantage of country A to produce cotton, exchange it with chocolate from country B, because this can be produced more easily, right? So that is the major assumption of Ricardo's idea of comparative advantage. Now, if we think critically about this, we can already see a couple of fallacies, right? Because first of all, this theory of comparative advantage has been at the crux of many economists talking about you know, how the global rela social relations occur and why it is to the advantage of many African countries and countries in the global south to engage in the globalization process. And many have argued this whole idea of globalization is just another language for imperialism, right? Because they argue that it, it's to the advantage of an African country to produce cotton and give it to country B, because country B maybe can make cars and give it to African countries, because African countries don't have the technology to make cars, and even though they could potentially make cars, and country B doesn't have the laboring force to make cotton, even they could potentially make cotton. Now, can you imagine London growing pineapples? Right? Tanzania does grow pineapples. You grow pineapples and you export pineapples to London. But is there even the potential that you can grow pineapples in London? Forget about the labor availability, the technology. Is there even a potential to grow pineapples in London? No. no. Right? That means only Tanzania can produce pineapples and send them to London. This is the first fallacy that this idea of comparative advantage assumes that there's a potentiality for both countries to produce similar goods. It is just easier for one country to produce it than the other. When there is absolutely no way that one country can produce those goods, it is not to the advantage of the country that can produce it to export their goods to this country, right? And this idea of cars, let's say, right? That the technology available in country B allows them to produce cars more easily. In a country like Tanzania, can we produce cars? No, because we simply do not have the technological advancements to produce cars. Not because we lack in anything, but simply because of the nature of capital, right? So the exploitative nature of capital means that we have not reached the technological advancement to actually produce cars. So either way, this idea of comparative advantage simply holds no place. The second assumption is that there are no barriers to trade. That tr goods and services can move very easily between country A and country B. Is this the case in our countries? There are all kinds of barriers to trade that are to the disadvantage of our countries in most places, right? So in this book, similar to what Walter Rodney has argued on the question of imperialism, this is the argument that is made, only she makes it a more specific way using Ricardo's idea of comparative advantage, because this is mainstream economics that justifies these relationships. That the nature of imperialism, the nature of the so-called globalized world, 
the barriers to trade, the uneven development of capitalism has made it so that this idea of free trade, this idea of free movement of services, this idea that we can easily engage in the tr free trade of the globalized um, world if we just wanted to, is, it's a fallacy. It can simply not exist to our advantage. Yeah, yeah, it's a lie. It cannot exist to our advantage, right? And this is the argument she makes in the Republic of Hunger, where she's really proposing that it has led to food insecurity, it has led to a, a crisis of agriculture, it has led to the starvation, and actually the population decrease of a place like India, right? So when we talk about the question of uneven development, When we talk about the question of uneven development, we're looking at first, we're looking at two aspects that Rodney always addresses. First, the complexity of societies in pre-capitalist societies, its unevenness, its um, complexity, exactly. And we're looking at the particular moment that we have been going through in colonialism, through various stages of imperialism, and how that has been a universal process of capital to coercively bring the whole world in the fold of capital, and how that has led to uneven development. And that uneven development has taken on the form of the center of capital reaching a certain advancement in technology where the rest of the world has not reached that advancement because of the super exploitation of the rest of the world. And we, this idea of globalization, et cetera, we can go back to this idea of comparative advantage and how it has nothing to do with us. It is simply another way to exploit us further, okay? So keeping all of this in mind, we can now move into what revolutionary possibilities exist in these contradictions of the world, right? Now, before we move there, perhaps we can um, discuss this, this second element further, just to make sure we're on the same page. Sorry, so the distinction of capitalism achieved is by itself of little or to no value in terms of capitalism. Sorry. The distinction of capitalism by itself is of little to no value. Is that true? In the world we live in, yes in the kind of relationships it's produced, in the kind of exchanges and trades, no, it doesn't have the value of the goods that it values so much. and um, development and so forth, and where we are today with um, and Walter Rodney um, and his book in terms of the economic terrorism that has happened through imperialism and colonization, and how, for instance, we as activists today need to use this, um, um, his works, in fighting our, our, our struggles, be it the local economic struggles or um, the, the global south, in terms of um, bringing about equality and then fighting this economic terrorism when it comes to the World Trade Organization, the WTF, um, these loans that we're forever making and forever paying back. And we have been used and, what is it, mined out, but yet we are still owing and owing, so it would be generations of, of, of being indebted to these colonizers and through this imperial um, 
and capitalist system. So how do we, for me, I want to get to the next part is, how do we organize ourselves and our struggles to bring this down and say, this system is not working for our people. We don't owe you, I almost want to swear, we don't owe you anything, you know? What it is is that you owe us. I don't even want to go with the competitive, competitive analysis and the exploitation of, of our peoples right across the world to hold this system that's not working for us in place. But what is it for today? in terms of youth struggles, let me go there, in terms of workers' struggles, in terms of our working class struggles, that we need to, as, as people across this globe, as working class people, stand up and fight for, and not be romantic about these issues or confused, but as Rodney put these issues out there, this is what has happened to us, and these are the causes and the struggles that we must fight, and we at which levels. Uh, he was a revolutionary activist, and not just, um, uh, what is it, a theorist, um, like many of us are. Okay, thank you. It's my question. I raised my hand. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, no, my question is on is on the on, on, on the on the issue of imperialism, or, or so to say, our colonialism. So, understanding that uh, pre -cap in the pre-capitalist um, moment, right, there were already existing trades uh, and so forth, right, and then we come to the change or whatnot. So, I want to understand: are, are we are we then saying now that imperialism existed then, but then it was so much. Um, people of Africa, so to say, right, were benefiting from it. Did it evolve now to suddenly sustain capitalism? Or are we saying, or are we saying now, after colonialism, that is when it started to exist. I think I'm just fumbling to actually get as in, when did it actually exist in Africa, pre-colonialism or after? Yeah, yeah, quickly, Doctor, I just wanted to ask on this issue of uneven development. Um, I think, I mean, just be, to be problematic a bit, that where the countries that are developed further than others have then a right to, to lead society. And I think that one of the big things in the colonial period is that the fact that Europe had developed this technology of the, theirs, of weapons and able to shoot and able to subjugate. And that today, we see that the strong uh, imperialist countries, your Chinas, your, your Russias, it's because of their uh, technological advancement. They are way far. And I'm thinking that while in Africa, we might hold anti-imperialist politics, we might hold anti-colonist politics, if we are not developed in terms of the tools and the interaction with the environment, will we ever even stand a chance against these big powers of imperialism, if our development was still underdeveloped. We, I mean, uh, the, the reason that North Korea is, is respected, even by the US, is that they can bomb us now while we're sitting with a button without even asking questions. So is the question of, of, of underdevelopment uh, putting us in a position of disadvantage, no matter how much politics and anti-imperialist politics we can hold uh, in terms of ideology and also political direction? Okay, sure. Can I um, respond before we take any more? Because I see there's more. Yeah, and I think we can do that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I will respond because they are all moving us right into the direction we want to go into next, right? Um, but just to clarify, this no, this is not a case of imperialism, the pre-capitalist world. Um, to say that there were less than idyllic relations and they were coercive, etc. It's not to say that they were imperialist in nature. It's simply to describe that the society existed in a different way and there were relationships of exploitation. But imperialism, the way we imagine it, right? Imperialism, and actually you're not completely wrong, right? In asking that question. Because many respected scholars think of empire rather than imperialism, right? So they think of empire building, the expansion of territory in the 10th century, you know, as, as a form of coercion very similar to imperialism today. So it is actually one, one debate that is being had. 
But that's not my opinion, and I think that wouldn't be Walter Rodney's opinion. It was obviously not Walter Rodney's opinion. It's a very different nature. When we think of imperialism, we're really talking about the legacies of slavery across the Atlantic Ocean, right? We're talking about colonialism in the 19th century. We're really talking about the relationship that these countries had to the center and advancement of capitalism, the exploitative relationship they had. These pre-capitalist societies, it's not to say that there weren't any exploitative relationships, but they did not exist in the same way. They did not have the same functions. Production was not organized in the same way. There were very vast differences, right? The specific nature of capitalism and imperialism as a formation of capitalism is that it necessarily brought in the rest of the world into the fold of capital that was being controlled by the center, right? That brings us to your question on the idea that if they've had this technological advancement, then why do they not have the right to lead the world? And will we continue to be exploited because we'll never reach that technological advancement? First, the technological advancement was created by exploiting the rest of the world, right? We have to keep that in mind. Secondly, now that they have reached a higher level of technological advancement than the rest of us, and this idea that they had better technologies, hence they could come in and colonize, I'm not saying that's what you're arguing, but it, it does tend to be an idea that comes. They didn't necessarily have better technologies than us, but they had the need to enter the rest of the world because they didn't have, what it, they didn't have sufficient resources of their own. Right? So when the explorers come and they see what we have, they want it because they don't have it. It's just as simple as that. So they use arms to a greater extent to get that. We didn't necessarily have to engage in a similar process. It's not that we didn't have arms and warfare. We did, but we used it to expand territory, perhaps, not necessarily to extract resources that we did not have to the same extent. So that idea of technological advancement is it was born out of necessity to exploit the rest of the world, and then it was advanced by super exploiting the rest of the world. Now the idea that should we now not aspire to reach that level of advancement, right? This idea of, um, what's, what is it called? Rising Africa? Africa rising. Right, This whole idea of the middle class and Africa rising and building states that look like Singapore, these fake cities on the coast, like all these ideas are present in our lingo today, right? Um, this is part of the discourse, that if we can like mimic the center of capital, if we can reach the heights that they have reached, if we can rely on this upcoming middle class to lead us in the advancement to technology, Perhaps then we can be an equal player in this globalizing world. Based on the things I've argued, this is almost an impossibility. Because even if we have a small, tiny segment of Africans who look like they can be competitors in the rest of the world, that's precisely the point. They're a small, tiny segment of the population. A majority of the population do not benefit from it. This idea of the trickle down, that if a small group of people benefit from the world economy, it'll trickle down to the rest. It doesn't work, precisely because of this. They're subsidizing their own labor. They're not benefiting from anyone, not from the state, not from the middle class. The way we describe this kind of migrating labor, right? So this idea of a rising middle class that is going to lead Africa to this advanced, shiny space that is going to compete in the world and be on par with the center of capital, is an impossibility given the condi current conditions we're in. And Walter Rodney saw that at the time he was writing How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And in a series of essays he wrote on the Russian Revolution, which are actually very poignant to the condition of Africa, he argued that this idea that we can reach that stage is an impossibility precisely because of our history. So what does that mean? If we can't do that, if we can't reach that because of historical factors, not because we're less equipped or we're a victim of any sort. But if we can't, because of historical factors, what are our options? Very similar to Samir Amin's idea of delinking, theory of delinking, Walter Rodney proposed an example that he saw in the country he was teaching, Tanzania, right? The Uyama villages. There were many debates 
There were two more questions, right, before I interrupted. Yeah, sorry. Let's, let's take two more, and then we can move. Thank you very much. Uh, just my concern about uh, before we did have a complexity of a type of society which is was uh, giving a balance in Africa in the continent we're living, which was amazing. But along the time uh, that the complexity of type of society we have, which was being wiped out, as someone say, uh, replaced by a system which I believe. Uh, we miss something very important about if the Western peoples was trying to choose the type of society which was designed by Africa, our planet should not be the way it is today because of so many mess. And the other thing is the fact that this, um, what can I say, uh, the states are the umbrella of the imperialism system we all going to be stuck in whatever we're going to try to fight against imperialism because the states are umbrellas. So what should we do? Because the imperialism system is a global uh, point where it makes prisoner all the states around the world. So what can we do to first challenge the umbrella and challenge the imperialist system? Or which can we start with? so that we can make our society to look different. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much, Doc. I have two questions, very, very simple questions. And it's difficult to ask, to ans to ask these questions because I'm trying to imagine a, you know, a different possibility of existence. I've not lived under socialism. Uh, my experience and my, my framework is within uh, a capitalist mode of production. So I want to ask you this question. What are the benefits, if any, uh, in the industrialization moment? Because you spoke there about a stagist uh, theory, uh, which is, you said was explained by Marx and how society has developed through different stages. Uh, from the serfs or communalism to capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. So what could you know, uh, be gleaned, lessons that could be gleaned and, le and, 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 and benefits out of, without focusing on the, the, the destructive and the degenerative element of capitalism in advancing society? Uh, secondly, I mean, do you think with Walter Rodney's how Europe underdeveloped Africa, or the, the, the uneven, the disparities in development. Would it have been profitable for capital to colonize or to enslave Europeans there, or white people there in Europe, than to specifically come to Africa and target very specific bodies, black bodies, uh, to kickstart their the capitalist accumulation process. Would it have been profitable and beneficial for Europe, for whites to colonize each other there in Europe than for them to travel all the way to Africa and take our people as bodies to build uh, the civilization and the development of the global north? Thanks. Um, so I'm fairly new to the space. Um, but I'd firstly like to say that I, I really appreciate the way that you pragmatically or broke down the, the concepts initially. And it's sort of a comment slash question, and I think you started alluding to it, that the way uh, Walter Rodney broke things down and, for example, as you say, not romanticized the past and basically sort of spoke towards identity. So it looks at, for me, it looks at the history and saying that we were a people on this continent before that had an identity which was stripped away by imperialism and colonialism. And there was this event that sort of interjected that and changed the narrative. 
and then you look at all the tools that have, uh, it seems like there's a case of tools that have been presented in terms of how these mechanisms have been deployed to make capitalism work and in relation to Africa and the center of capitalism. Um, but sort of the message that I'm trying to work out in this conversation is then from that, is it sort of an exploration of, okay, we have these causes and we're looking to how to course correct those in the current state. Um, does that provide the platform? Um, as you said, we'll never catch up. Um, but if we understand how we've been affected with those kind of um, negative tools, I don't know how to exp express clearly, um, those negative tools give very direct impact in certain areas. And by understanding that with, as you say, with fragments of understanding that we were a people before and drawing on the fact that we do have an identity that's been stripped away, there's a process of rebuilding that identity um, and positively moving forward in with that identity that we can go forward with. So as opposed to perpetuating this, this system in rectifying a broken system within it. So you can, from, from in a personal level, you can always delve deeper and deeper into what has happened, how it has happened. But there's a certain level of where you sort of gold plating an idea already and you're not adding any value in the present and going forward. So you get these lessons learned and you can then basically derive and start as, as a country or a community looking at how you can actually improve that off that baseline. Um, so yeah. Should we, um, let us, should we continue before? I, I definitely think we're in a moment where the questions are pointing towards that and we need to make the point. Okay. So yeah, I think we can move forward. Okay. I hope that's okay. Um, I promise you, you will have more questions. Um, yeah, the, the ideas of what now, right? First of all, I will have to insist, I think, as a historian and as Walter Rodney did as a historian himself and as a historian myself, that it is never, ever futile to understand the problem. It is never, ever futile to understand our history. There is no futility in it. And of course, we're all eager, we all, for very clear reason, we're living under very dire conditions. And the comrade described it to me earlier that we live under depressive conditions, but with a lot of passion, right? And it's absolutely true. We're in very, very dire, depressing conditions. And the idea that we want to see a way forward is, it is human, it is survival. But we have to understand very, very systematically and very carefully what our history is and how it has come to this point. Rodney always emphasized this. I've read in, in trying to um, recall some ideas I was reading, both this Russian revolution and the introduction to this version of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, and Leo Zelling's new book, um, A Revolutionary of Our Time, on Walter Rodney. And in all three, at one space or the other, the idea of Rodney's of spending as much time and having as much insight and critical thought into our history was always prevalent, that we have to be thrice as better as they are in their theories and their systems and their notions. We have to understand them critically because there's no way we can understand anything else if we don't. And it's not simply about theory. It's not simply that we equip ourselves theoretically to express to them that we're intellectually on their par. But our solutions, our ideas of the future, they all lie in what we just described. This idea of revolutionary potential for Rodney, he brought, he, he brought it up in the very idea of unevenness, of contradiction. In a society where there are such stark contradictions between the classes, Right? There's an exploited class and exploiting class. There is bound to be resistance to that oppression. This is simply dialectics. There is bound to be resistance to that oppression. Now, how that resistance will occur and when it will occur 
is the question, right? That can only be answered by the way we live in our experiences in this particular moment. And that was his idea in Groundings. The concrete conditions will tell us what our solutions are, right? So for example, when he, this, this book that came out on um, the Russian Revolution, believe it or not, Rodney had written a series of essays on the Russian Revolution, right? He was analyzing the Russian Revolution from an African perspective and the lessons that could be learned about the Russian Revolution, which is very interesting because he was using a period in history that was a Western period that was written by Western scholars. He was analyzing it from an African perspective and he was using the lessons of the Russian Revolution to understand what was happening in a place like Tanzania. And in, he agreed with perspectives partly from Trotsky and partly from Lenin, which he advanced further for the benefit of Africa, right? The idea of collectivization of um, land, the idea of production in the countryside, the idea of using technologies from socialist countries in order to advance these collectivization projects in, in a country like Tanzania. These are the kind of debates he was engaging in. So let me give you an example of how Rodney responded in that particular moment. He was enthralled by the Soviet Union because he saw the Soviet Union as not necessarily this perfect beacon of hope and socialism. It had various problems that nobody could deny. But he saw it for two reasons as being very beneficial to the idea of the revolutionary potential that was held in Africa. One, the idea that it occurred through combined and uneven development, that there was internal kind of oppression in Eastern Europe. There was a destruction of land and so on. There was a destruction of um, the peasants. There was destruction of their land and how they related to that land within the Russian Revolution, right? Within, I mean, sorry, prior to the Russian Revolution. It was not a case where it happened, the Russian Revolution happened simply by exploitation in one space. There was a center and a periphery that was creating this combined and uneven development. The second potentiality that he saw in discussing the Russian Revolution was this idea that through these contradictions that occurred, there was a potential to skip the stages that capitalism didn't have to re lead into socialism. That this idea of technological advancement eventually leading into socialism didn't have to occur in that same way. In fact, technological advancement could occur under socialist states. And so he translates it into Uyama, which was loosely called African socialism, but which Rodney called scientific socialism in Tanzania, right? Whether he's correct or not, but this was his analysis, that the collectivization process, which was very problematic in a country like Tanzania, but Rodney saw great hope in it, the collectivization process and focusing on production in the countryside, focusing on the peasant, and finally focusing on an alliance between the peasants and the working class, can actually lead us outside this quagmire of depending on the center of capital, right? So in some ways, he was talking of Samira means delinking, completely removing yourself from the, rela the dependency relationship with the West and creating your own systems, right? And that is not to say that you're creating a utopia outside of capital. He was very much using the tools and mechanisms offered in capitalism in order to imagine a socialist possibility. But this socialist possibility was created through the technologies and the advancements that could be, that could, they were birthed under capitalism, right? So it is not that it is completely removed from that, because I too think very similarly to what you're saying, we cannot think outside the paradigms which we're in. There's a limitation to our thought, but that does not mean we cannot process and imagine and create potentiality from what we have. And I think this is also very much Rodney's position. It is within these contradictions, the contradictions of uneven development, the contradictions of a pre-capitalist society and how it was formulated, that revolutionary potential existed. So I've given you one example, this escaping the stages model because we simply can't engage in it through delinking, but also through creating a potentiality of the peasants as a revolutionary force focusing on the countryside by collectivizing farms and using the technologies, right, of the socialist formations. But in our particular moment, I believe that there are limitations to these ideas, right? And this is something I would really like to talk about more. I'll give you an example. 
And I think this brings us back to this, to the pre-capitalist idea. In my own uh, research, I was looking at the Mombasa Republican Council in, um, in Mombasa in Kenya, and really looking at secessionist movements and how that time of this, this time when, when a group of people decide they can no longer be part of the dominant political expression in the nation state, in the language of the nation state, what language do they use to show their grievance? And what does it really mean? So I got interested in the Mombasa Republican Council because it was a very violent history that they were subjugated to, right? It was a group of people who lived in this particular area called Diani in Mombasa. The state basically burnt their land overnight, literally burnt their land to the ground overnight. And hundreds of thousands of um, peasants and working people who were dependent on that land had nowhere to go. They, were complete, they lost their land, their means of livelihood, and it was something that was kept very secretive. The response to that was organizing along historical claims that Mombasa was not a part of Kenya, that Mombasa belonged to a different history, right? So the, lang the political language that they chose to use was that we no longer want to be a part of Kenya. We as a people want to develop our own state, our own state that reflects our own identity and our own values based on our history of the Indian Ocean. How did, they, how did they make that language legible to the state? They wrote a letter to the Queen of England saying that when you came, you colonized Kenya, but we were a protectorate of the British government, which technically is true, but for all intensive purposes, they were treated as a colony and as part of Kenya. But they were simply doing this in order to make themselves audible to the Kenyan state that look, we can write, we can read, and we can express ourselves politically. We understand a political language. Very quickly, they were dismissed. They were dismissed by the left. They were dismissed by activists. They were dismissed, of course, by the reactionaries and the state, right? That this organization is chaotic. It doesn't know what it's doing. They're writing letters to the queen. They are talking about secession. They have no plan. They have no idea of state or governance. It is a very um, chaotic movement, at best spontaneous, and it won't, ex it won't last. But speaking to the organizers of the MRC, the one very clear position was we want our land, right? We want to our land. We want to live with some dignity on our land. And our history says that we're people who have lived off this land with great exchanges across the ocean. So the memories that they were excavating, the ideas that they were excavating to make themselves legible, to make themselves look that they were people who were different, who had dignity, were these ideas. Ideas that survived in fragments, that were contradictory to the present moment, that made no sense when immersed in the social relations of the present moment, but that nonetheless existed in fragments. And that's what I was trying to argue when I was talking about the idea of fragments. They had memories of Islamic city-states and civilizations, right? They had memories of various writings and documents that were produced during this time that showed them to be a people of great wealth and uh, trade and exchange, etc. They had memories of their land belonging to different systems, right? Communal systems. They had different relationship to the land in the pre-capitalist period. Those memories persevered, albeit in fragmented forms. But when they were extracted in the present moment, and I'm talking about as early as 2019, right? When they were extracted in the present moment, they made no sense. It made no sense to say that all land belongs to God and not to the state. It made no sense to say that we want to build a state based on exchange across the Indian Ocean, right? It made no sense to write a letter to the Queen of England. It made no sense to use Islam as an organizing force because immediately they were dismissed as a terrorist organization, right? These made no sense according to the system we lived in. But the idea, but dismissing them as a movement also makes no sense for those who believe in a revolutionary potential of our society. Because this is the language people use to organize. 
whether it has the potential of being conservative, whether we don't agree with it from a Marxist perspective, this is the language people use to organize. They use the language of Islam. They use the language, at least in this particular case, they use the language of secession. They bring together various languages in order to assert one claim. We want our land and we want dignity on our land, right? And they're using the contradictions of history, the lingering fragmented memories of history, and the contradictions of the present in order to organize themselves. So when the state called them a an, an, uh, terrorist organization, immediately their response was to say, no, we're not a terrorist organization. We may be Muslims. You know, we may be organizing around Islamic language and so on, but we're not a terrorist organization. We simply want our land. And the reality of their grievances came to the fore. So the languages people use, the way they excavate history, may not exist in the linear forms that we think. They may exist in sometimes forms that look very, very reactionary, right? But we have to be willing to engage in those formulations. And the only way we can engage is by understanding the trajectories that they have taken. So I do not think that the way people organize on the ground will necessarily always take on the language of socialism and re political revolutionary, a political revolutionary language. But I also do not think as people who understand these histories, we should engage by dismissing those potentialities. And I'm sure many of you can give examples of how these things can be redirected, how these contradictions can be understood, and how people organize around these contradictions. But I do think that a large part, a large part of our so-called solutions and emancipatory potentials and revolutionary potentials exist, exist in this history. Because even the way people organize is by excavating fragments of this history. Therefore, history should not simply be seen as historicism, right? Narrating event after event after event. But it should be seen as a revolutionary method. A revolutionary method that people use, whether we like it or not, day to day in order to create a political language. And if we don't understand the history that they're using, we can very easily fall trap to dismissing it and using the language of the West or using the language of the state. You would be surprised at how many leftist organizations did dismiss the MRC on the grounds that they were simply allying themselves with Muslim organizations, with external Muslim organizations, completely dismissing their grievances around land, right? So we need to understand these histories. We need to understand where people, where people organize from. And it might not look the way we want it to look. Perhaps we can continue with those questions. So I'm, 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 I'm looking at time. It's 8 o'clock. I'm going to take one round of questions. And then I'll leave it up to you to decide. But I do think um, there's a lot to be left with. And to, we'll, we'll still have a teaching tomorrow to discuss things. Um, but we don't want to be out of here by 9. So, 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 we'll, so just looking at time and thinking around that. So questions, I saw one there, one there still. OK. And on this side of the room? Their comrade. This comrade first, because it was earlier. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I guess my question is around, um, so you talk about like uh, Walter Rodney's contradictions when it comes to um, how the people who exist outside of the structures of uh, colonialism and capitalism, like the contradictions that like lie within themselves, which uh, a, a good example that you are giving is how people in Tanzania has used um, the belief in Islam to organize themselves and, and, and voice out their opinions to the powers that be. Um, when you take that and um, measure it along, um, you know, other pre-colonial ambitions, you know, looking at maybe places where Islam didn't exist, but uh, people had uh, 
their own indigenous beliefs and belief systems. Um, yeah, I guess my question is, uh, firstly, like within those contradictions, how does or how do we find um, in a bridge between that I in a way that like the, 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 the indigenous and I don't, I, I don't know if I should even use the word indigenous, but like people who exist outside of the belief in Islam, but who also exist within the continent, how do we align, um, if that's the question, like how do we align their ambitions with the ambitions that you've shared of uh, people who believe in Islam were able to, to voice out their opinions? And I guess the reason I'm asking this question is because, um, you know, 70% of the world's population will be living in informal settlements in, in, in cities by 2050. And um, I come from an organization called SLAM or Sheikh Bilal's International where we um, work with uh, organized communities around 33 African countries. Um, people whom you've also mentioned that have moved into uh, urban areas to seek greener pastures and so forth. And according to my experience and what I've seen unfolding is that the people who move, the people who move from these, um, uh, you know, rural areas or whatever into cities, when they get into cities, they, they, they are co-opted in one way or the other into, you know, the direction and the path of uh, capitalism. And, you know, they, in one way or the other co-opted into also contributing into um, creating new policies, which in, I believe that like still contribute to the path of colonialism in one way or the other. So like how do you, you know, like find the bridge between, or even can the people in cities being co-opted and being, um, you know, um, sucked into conversations that uh, push the push colonial ambitions how do those people begin the conversation of who they are adopt Rodney's ideologies or look at like their own self enrichment as opposed to um, feeding the, the the capitalist systems I don't know if my question like uh, makes sense Thank you. Mm, now, saying that we, uh, we should not just dismiss every attempt of a revolt uh, and then we okay, fine. Let's say that reactionary, uh, reactionaries do a revolutionary thing and saying that we are trying to delink from international capitalism. And then, we, uh, it, and then it succeeds, we delink from uh, reactionary capitalism. And uh, we all know from history that capitalism cannot, uh, cannot uh, exist in isolation. Are we not creating uh, material conditions once again for Africans to invade Europe like the Moors did in the 1700s? And then the Europeans once again, expelling Africans like they did in uh, 1495, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, creating another loop of imperialism, African imperialism towards uh, Europeans and European imperialism towards Africans. Should we actually allow that a, 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 a bourgeois revolution happens of delinking from uh, international capitalism in Africa? Um, I think, oh yeah, Melwin, Kamalam Dongande, so as Simon said, yeah, this question is still, you know, I'm still trying to process it, right, before, and I think um, the person that was speaking right now, I'm kind of attached to what I was going to ask, but I think you spoke a lot of de about development, and I think it's, it's the now question of what does it look like now, right, or what does it really look like if, um, I mean, looking at the unevenness and um, 
that um, the transformation and destruction has caused, right, or gave birth to, right? And looking at um, exactly your examples that you gave of um, being forced, not by hand, to actually move into urban areas to survive because you can no longer live, you know, in your own land. And looking at um, how you'd also, you know, also, I'm also thinking about how the development now, right, how people also already have answers of what it looks like for capitalism, right? We already know, but if um, people say, exactly what Umama was saying, that what, um, let's say no to these systems that no longer work for us, right? And people already have answers for that. It, it's, it's, it's clear to say, if we're saying no to capitalism, therefore we know there's no capitalism, and we know no exploitation, because workers are no longer going to work, and they're no longer feeding, this, feeding the same system that does not, does not um, work for them, right? And which means liberation for the workers. But also there's been um, arguments that it also means death and hunger, you know? Because we've seen exactly what this, this transformation mean, you know, and the unevenness that it, they also create at some point. So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in knowing but how do we also then mobilize, and I think you also touched on that, how people mobilize under a system that did not work for them, but also how do we really truly mobilize under that system when using these same ideologies is also a tool to demobilize those that are oppressed, you know? Because, for example, people would say, let's really just let go of capitalism, and people would say, oh, no, things should just come back to those that, um, um, you know, they should come back to the people, right? And the people will also ask, but who are the people? So automatically it just demobilizes um, the oppressed, because now, you know, though there are those that are saying, you know what, it's fine, let's just share these things. And those, those that are saying, you know, just give it all back. Ne? And therefore, how do we then survive? I'm really, and I'm saying, I'm, I don't know if it's really a question we're hearing right now, but yeah, I, I'm really interested in finding out how, or what does it look like, what does development look like, and avoiding, and also using the same tools um, as these ideologies to actually go that route, but also avoiding exactly what you've mentioned there. And yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's somewhere. Yeah, I just had a, a, a shorter question, but probably uh, on a different subject related to the concept of whether we can still consider this proletarian universalism and specifically related to the, the problem of, as you were mentioning, super exploitation with relation to the labor aristocracy and the Western proletariat and whatnot, and whether when considering this revolutionary possibility in the world, it's possible to still consider this overall global solidarity between the workers of the world or whether there's a diverging interest between the workers in the Western world and those in the global South. So that'll be the last round of questions. It's a lot of things to <laughs> address. Um, yeah, and then and then we'll sort of break for the evening, if that's okay. Uh, I see a, I see a consensus, but I think there would be more and more and more um, questions if we if we left it open. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I I really really want to say that I certainly don't have answers. <laughs> um, I think none of us have answers on what can be done because that only happens through collective struggle. It only happens when we are confronted with crisis and we're responding to those crises. What we can do is prepare ourselves as a people for such crisis, prepare ourselves for what we see when we exit this room, the methods we can use to prepare ourselves. And I think things like this, teachings, remembering our history, reading comrades like Walter Rodney, reminding ourselves of the way they view their history, these are forms of preparation. We don't simply arm ourselves physically, we arm ourselves intellectually. And intellectually arming ourselves is not simply so that we can debate these questions when we leave this room, but we can see the world around us with a different set of questions and respond to it in a different way, right? So if we sit in this room asking one person, two people, one book, two books, 
What is the answer to the problems we will face outside? It is an absolutely justified question, but it might not give us the answers we seek because those answers will only come on the ground as we struggle. That is the only place that they will come, right? And that is precisely what Rodney kept emphasizing to us in groundings. Concrete conditions demand concrete solutions. The concreteness of what we are faced with, there is no history that can prepare us for the conditions we will face when we go outside. We can only learn from it and ask a different set of questions. So these examples that I gave of the MRC, it's not an answer. I am by no means saying a secessionist movement that uses the language of Islam is the answer to our problems, right? It's an example of how people organize on the ground, right? When I talk of um, Rodney and how he thought about Uyama and integrating it into the internationalist socialist system, because the context in which he lived, you had something like the Soviet Union, right? And he was thinking of the Soviet Union in order to think about Uyama in Tanzania and how it could be integrated with the kind of movements that exist, existed globally which for his time was revolutionary because one, it represented the audaciousness of a thinker from the global south to analyze a Western movement, and two, it provided for global solidarity of how movements, peasant movements, peasant-based movements could be integrated into a global socialist order and use the technologies of that socialism. We don't have that today, right? We had Venezuela, we had, but we don't have that today. So what is our context? We can learn from Rodney that he was audacious enough to analyze revolutionary movements around the world and see how we could benefit and integrate and f show solidarity for those movements. How can we do that today? Pan-Africanism, for example, that's a way, political pan-Africanism, forming solidar political and intellectual solidarities, right? How can we understand our present conditions? Not by mimicking, but learning from the past. And the idea about workers and workers of the world and the solidarity, we live under very different conditions, right? Workers around the world live under very different conditions. I think for Rodney, he saw the potentiality, much like Lenin, Lenin's argument, of a solidarity between workers and peasants. And for him, workers and peasants, for Lenin, they were not, they might have, have, have had um, contradictions. The workers and the peasants might have been contradictory classes because they related to the land and industry and working in a different way and production in a different way, but they were not antagonistic classes. And that's a very important point to note in our conditions, for example. We shouldn't fall trapped to the idea that we've all moved towards the industry and we have a working class and the peasant no longer exists, even in a place like South Africa. We should not move on the trap that the working class of the world have all the same interests. But at the same time, while we recognize the contradictions these are not antagonistic classes, right? There are solidarities that can be formed at a particular moment, and those solidarities might break at a different moment. But those conditions will only be assessed under concrete conditions of struggle. I often go back to this quote by Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, who was a literary critic but wrote so well on the idea of history, right? That the history of the people, he gives a metaphor of a wave, a wave from the ocean, right? When there's a wave, a big wave, that's coming and like curling, at the bottom of that wave, you see the white foam, right? The white foam where the water is about to clash into the water again. It is in that white foam that our histories and our struggles exist. They're not predetermined. We don't know how they will exist. They will only exist when the clash happens. That white foam will only be seen when that clash happens, underneath the curl of the wave, underneath the mainstream, right? And that is how I want us maybe to start, um, that we can ask questions, we can prepare ourselves, we can understand the conditions we live in and the conditions that have brought us to this phase, but the real struggle will only happen on the ground. And the answers will only be available when that struggle is happening, when we're participating in it. Outside of it, we're simply preparing ourselves. <laughs>
We're simply asking the right questions and simply being able to recognize what might have an emancipatory potential. So, yeah, answers, we might not get answers today, but we'll get questions and that's always, I think, a good thing. If we come out with more questions than when we started, I think we're on the right track. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you for joining us, for making the trip <laughs> to join us as well, um, and for being in the space. I am excited about the questions. I'm also excited about what people might engage in the next two days regarding these questions. I think uh, you've, you've given us a lot to think about in terms of what is the potential, what Rodney's ver like vision of history offers us. Um, and I think we were very lucky to just have this engagement. And also in such a popular way. It wasn't a university lecture at all. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. There is...